This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. And welcome everybody to a special episode of the Animaniacast. This is Randy Rogel and you are listening to the Animaniacast. And welcome everybody once again to the Animaniacast. We are the only podcast out there dedicated to the animated series, Animaniacs. And each week we usually talk about an episode of the series, uh, discussing all the cultural references and gags that we can find. But today we have a very special episode dealing all about the music of Animaniacs. I am Joey and joining me once again are my co-hosts, Nathan... Yes, sir, Bobby. And across the country in Georgia, it's Kelly. Hey there. And we are very excited that uh, our friend of the show and creator of Animaniacs, Tom Ruger, is here once again with us. Hello, nurses. <laughs> and joining us for the first time is a man who has written some some of the most memorable songs of Animaniacs, and he can currently be seen touring the country with Rob Paulson in... Uh, Animaniacs in concert. It's Mr. Randy Rogel. I would say hello, Joseph, and all the Animaniacs uh, fans. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Randy and Tom, for being on the show today. Uh, this is quite an honor. We're going to be uh, getting into some of the uh, talk of Animaniacs music. This is a very complex topic. It's a very fun topic, though, but. Uh, Hopefully we'll be able to just kind of scratch the surface of some of the what makes Animaniacs so great. So, again, thank you guys for being on. Great to be here. Yes, our pleasure. Before we talk about how, Randy, how you got involved into the show and everything like that, Tom, music has always been a really important element in cartoons that you've produced. Uh, but it really seemed to become an incredibly important part of Animaniacs cartoons. So when you were in the development phase of Animaniacs, was there a conscious decision to make Animaniacs more musical than previous cartoons you were involved with? Uh, definitely a conscious decision. Yes, we, we had uh, had a very good run with Tiny Toons, and we had learned a great deal from that. We also had a lot of rules with Tiny Toons. We were dealing with uh, younger versions of the original Looney Tunes characters. So uh, we had a certain marching order there. With Animaniacs, uh, it was sort of a, a blank page. We could really uh, create brand new material. And we knew that uh, we had a cast that, that was a great cast. We had uh, great comic characters. We had sold it to Stephen as this sort of uh, irreverent comedy with wild characters and great songs. We had, when we pitched the show to Stephen, we uh, I sang like the Pinky and the Brain theme song, and he liked that. And so we he knew there was going there were going to be songs involved. Now with our cast, we selected hand selected uh, actors who had been extremely successful singing on Tiny Tunes. For instance, Rob Paulson, who didn't have a giant role on Tiny Tunes, but every time we used him, he sang up a storm, and with. Rob, as the central uh, actor for uh, both Pinky and the Brain and uh, Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, we knew we had a great singer. We also knew Tress was a great singer, and we also knew that Jess Harnell could uh, sing Rock Out. So uh, once we had a cast, we knew we could write songs for these characters. And uh, then we, of course, had Bernadette Peters involved. So what are you going to do? you got to write some songs for Bernadette. Uh, so I, I think you'll notice in the very first handful of episodes, even before Randy, uh, we, we sucked Randy into our, our atmosphere, uh, the very first scripts uh, all had uh, little songs in them. And uh, so it was going to be a musical comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and going along with that music, of course, composition-wise, there was uh, Richard Stone, Steve and Julie Bernstein, and and others composed tons of music that go went behind every single movement of these characters. Tell us a little bit about the the composition process and and what it was like working with these huge orchestras and and specifically with uh, Richard Stone as well. 
Well, Richard had done uh, a few of the scores on Tiny Toons. Uh, uh, and once he did one score on Tiny Toons, we said, oh, we want him to do all the scores on Tiny Toons. But we had other composers involved. And so when we had a new series come along, uh, uh, Tasmania, Richard took on Tasmania. And then we, we, uh, when we started doing Animaniacs, we realized we have to steal him from Tasmania and put him on this show. He really was sort of the Carl Stalling uh, of the second generation. He, he really lived and breathed uh, this orchestral comedy uh, that uh, Carl Stallings mastered uh, in the old days. So Richard uh, gathered around him, uh, of course, Steve Bernstein, Julie Bernstein, Carl Johnson, Gordon Goodwin, Tim Kelly, Eric Schmidt, Russell Brower even pitched in, Tom Lavin, uh, was our uh, music uh, uh, editor. And these, this team made the music for all uh, 99 episodes. Now, uh, in, in Tiny Toons, it wasn't just this core group. It was a, a different composer for every half hour. But Richard Stone really was, he was the lead composer and he had a lot of help from those other people I just named, but it was a very small group that mastered uh, all the uh, the music. Now, of course, when a guy like Randy, uh, who does uh, music and lyrics, is writing a song, uh, Richard and, and Julie and Steve don't have to worry too much about it. For people like me, when I'm writing stupid lyrics like Lake Teddy Kaka, uh, <laughs> I, I have to go to Richard and I have to say, please, please write pretty musical notes for this song, and they would do that. Uh, that was true with many of the writers. I mean, we had these great writers, uh, uh, Paul Rugg, Deanna Oliver, John McCann, Nick Hollander, uh, Peter Hastings, of course. He was like Randy. He could write his own music. But for most of us, we needed Richard and the team to come up with melodies for our crazy lyrics. But these guys, uh, you know, 99 episodes over uh, five years, uh, 21 minutes of music. Uh, the big score, the big orchestra that uh, Stephen had insisted on with Tiny Toons uh, continued with Animaniacs. So, Randy, I'm sorry I, I just ran with that, but I'm sure you have plenty you can add there. No, I mean, I think that says it all because I didn't, you know, I didn't do any scoring or arranging. I mean, that, that, that's a really, you know, highly skilled person in that area that does that. And uh, I, I agree, Tom, we had just the best guys. It was so exciting, don't you think, Tom? We would go into, you know, because the process is, like Tom would say, we would, you know, he'd write a lyric or we'd write a, they'd write a cartoon or maybe write a song, whatever. And that would be laid down just like on a little temp track so the actors could sing to it. Or if it was a cartoon, they would act to it, right? And then that gets storyboarded. Because the guy who's drawing it needs to hear in his ear so he can, you know, capture the performance of the person. And then it goes overseas, it gets animated, and, it, and when it comes back, the last thing we do really is music. And so we would get to go into the soundstage. Was that called the, the Carl Stalling soundstage? I think it's now the Clint Eastwood soundstage, right, Tom? But yes. we go to this big soundstage, and this, these guys come in with this orchestra, and what you have to understand is these people read notes faster than you read words. So, and, and in those days, too, we had a saying, see, now, like when I would write a song, right, literally, I, Tom, let me have a piano in my office, which was great. I would literally hit, you know, like one of those old cassette tape things, I would hit play and record, and then I would sing on the piano, and then I would put it on a cassette and send it down over the lyric sheet. And just based on that, Tom could listen to that, he'd give me notes, all that. Nowadays, you know, when I went, later on I went to Disney when all that notation stuff, they want to hear it with the woodwinds and all the everything oh. straight in there, you know. And so, but in the days that we were doing it, we would walk into that sound stage. These guys would walk, you know, kind of like, where's my, you know, where's my seat, you know. And we used to say the music was born at the podium because nobody had heard it and nobody knew what it sounded like until he dropped that baton. You know, they put the cartoon up on the screen and, and then, and you know, animation, especially the kind of stuff that they were doing for Tiny Toons and anime has, has a lot of hits. You know, and they would drop that baton and bam, these guys would play it perfect. 
and it would go like, and then Richard would stop them and go, hold on, bar 62, Woodwinds, that's a, that's a be natural. I'd go, how the hell did you hear that? You know, these guys really knew what they were doing. So it was an exciting process, right? Because, you know, Tom is the only guy I know that does it all, you know, because he, he's not just the producer and the creator, but Tom's a writer and he's an artist too. If I had to draw for a living, I would be dead. I'd starve to death. But Tom also wrote, has written tons and tons. If I had to read a note off a page, I'd be. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'd, so that's so it, it was, you know, to see these guys in their specialty doing what they were doing was really an exciting process for, for all of us, I think. And then, you know, just the level of ability. And then I think it was nice that Steven Spielberg grant. I get, how did that work, Tom? Did he negotiate that we would have the full orchestra? Because now it's all done with synthesizers and, you know, you know, um, well, I do understand uh, on the new series that is being planned, they, they want to continue that process of having a full orchestra, which I'm sure uh, somebody is, some accountant is blowing his brains out. Like, uh, you're kidding me. Yeah, but that's not, I'm sure Stephen wants that. So, uh, Yeah. Uh, that, is that a short enough answer for you there, uh, uh, Joseph? <laughs> yes, that's perfectly fine. Uh, well, let me tell you a story about Randy. So Randy's in his room. He's, you know, he's writing a song and uh, he's got the piano going, you know, Monterey, Monterey, it's the California live. You know, he's doing that and uh, he's pounding away in the next room. Deanna Oliver has just gotten back from the dentist. Right. And something's wrong with her tooth. And she's like, oh, oh my God. Oh. And he goes, Monterey, Monterey. And she's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> that goes back to the dentist and they left a whole bunch of instruments in the hole in her mouth so uh <laughs> that it worked out <laughs> yeah you've heard that one right randy <laughs> oh, Deanna never told me that that's a funny story <laughs> <laughs> one more quick question about uh richard stone i think is um he he's he's known as the great stonini is is there any way that he he got that that nickname right there or how did how did that come across john did you give him that name uh, I think it's Paul Rugg. I think Paul Rugg named him. It might have been Peter Hastings, but one of those two gentlemen uh, named him the great Stonini. And I do think uh, people started saying when at the end of a lot of our cartoons, he would put bump, 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 bump. Someone started singing at the end. I'm Richard Stone. <laughs> <laughs> That was mentioned in the, I think, one of the Animaniacs DVDs. That that was like his, that that wasn't his signature piece. Then he didn't intentionally put that in, right? As I'm Richard well, Stone. Well, he wasn't saying to himself, "I'm Richard Stone." But <laughs> I'm it Richard became Stone. very familiar to everyone. But it's just taken from, you know, he quoted, you know, the end of Animaniacs. Those are the facts. So he would he would end that data, but it was a great little ending. He was a remarkable musician. Uh, because I, I was talking to Stephen Julie. He would sometimes wake. John, did you know that he would wake up sometimes on the morning of a record, and he would sit down and write two minutes of music to, before going in. I mean, that's amazing that he had that ability. But it's like I think it's like Tom said. He he was Carl Stalling reincarnated. That's what what his life was. He he couldn't have imagined. Uh, a better job for himself. This was this was a dream job for him. He had been doing uh, some uh, some shows that were like uh, reality crime shows, and he would put like suspense music behind uh, Robert Stack talking about some crime, and he was just about cooked on that. So when this came along, he really just fell in love with it and made it his career. During the scoring sessions, were there any times when scores or tracks didn't work out and had to be redone? Gee, I wouldn't um, know about that, Tom. Do you know? Did, did just, that ever- uh, you know, every once in a while, maybe I would uh, look at something and and it it played it played a little too serious for me, or it was usually just a tone thing. And uh, uh, every once in a while, we'd do little tiny sections. We'd pick up little tiny sections of a score if we had the time to do so, uh, you know, it wasn't something I ever wanted to, uh, insist upon. And if, if it was, uh, maybe taking the, the cartoon in a, a, the wrong direction, you could maybe turn it down. You could turn it off. Uh, you could sometimes find a different piece of music to slide in there that had the right tone. So, uh, but I would say that was pretty rare to redo because these are pretty expensive little pieces of music that makes it. 
So there was, uh, do you have any thoughts on working with other Animaniacs composers, such as uh, Julie and Steve Bernstein, or Bernstein, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. It is Bernstein, yes. Bernstein. Well, Randy, you, you go first. Uh, we both worked with them on a lot of stuff. Very, very talented. In fact, when we did the idea of this Animaniacs Live, now Animaniacs in Concert, we were going to do it with several um, orchestras. We first did it with the Colorado Symphony, and we wanted it to be authentic. So we went back to Julie and Steve, which Richard was gone, and said, can you recreate those orchestrations um, but only for an 88 piece, you know, it was eight cause our, I think ours was like 40 piece, 42 pieces, something like that. That's right. So yeah. So Julian and Steve, another one I worked with a lot was uh, Gordon Goodwin. I went to mm-hmm. Disney after that. I saw her Gordon Goodwin all the time. Gordon has the big fat band. Gordon's got a bunch of Grammys too. Um, enormously talented guy, but these people are, are, you know, a list musicians and arrangers and scoring people. They really know what they're doing. Right. And of course, Julie and Steve, you know, they, they both, uh, Steve scored a lot of the episodes. Uh, anything that Richard wasn't scoring, Julie and Steve would often dive in. Uh, Julie wrote um, the music for a lot of uh, memorable tunes, uh, like, uh, <laughs> what's the Whippoorwill song, the Chubby Little Baby song? In the Whippoorwill, what was in the wind? <laughs> the wind will whip her back, the nice and chubby baby. When the whipper will whippers in the wind, the wind can whip her back. Oh, nice and chubby baby. I mean, uh, they they did uh, music for you know Lake Titicaca, uh, just all sorts of uh, great songs. Lake Titicaca, oh Lake Titicaca, it's between Bolivia and Peru. Lake Titicaca, oh Lake Titicaca, with waters. Whenever Deanna had one of those big musicals uh, with the the pigeons, West Side Story, all that. Les Miserables, yeah, right. Absolutely. Oh, Les Les Miserables, uh, beautiful. Uh, Anyway. These guys were working nonstop, and they were, again, they were just loving it. And they, they would live at their house, and they would be in their little world just writing music day after day. Like, like Randy said, get up in the morning, write two minutes of music, then have a coffee. And uh, So every week and a half, there'd be the scoring session. And this was like for them being let out for recess. Yeah. It was just like, oh, I get to leave my little weird... Uh, world at home and oh wait the, there's a sky and it's bright and and oh my gosh and like randy said then they hear their score come to life with 40 piece orchestra and it, it was just like heaven the, the analogy for tom and i like you know we'll write a script and so you you know the script's all you know we live kind of cerebral lives to tell you the truth you know we're in a room you're writing and you and so then you never know how that's going to turn it's, it's like tom said when we get to go into the scoring or see the actual animation done that's a treat, but the hard work is when you shut the door and you're in there by yourself. And that's where Steve and Julie lived a lot. And Richard did right. And, you know, they would have to wait, by the way, till the cartoon came back animated and Tom had approved everything. So he said, OK, this is locked to time now. And so, Tom, I mean, Tom, did they ever score to animatics or did they only do it to animate? I guess only to animation, right? Because we did we lock the animatics to time. Sometimes the, the little click track would be more elaborate than than the final. But it would never be a forty-piece orchestra click track. It would just be just right. So they would they would literally look at that cartoon then, right? Because it's locked to time, and they would you know like when 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 the brain would walk across the counter and his face growing in the they would go bum 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 and they'd have to and if he falls they'd have to score all those little hits. So they'd have to be looking at it. So they're sitting there racing to get that done. For, I mean, for 40 different instruments. And you go, well, look, is that a trombone doing that? Or do we have a woodwind or clarinet? They're making all those decisions on, under the supervision of Richard Stone. And then, of course, it, we'd get in, and the treat for them was now to see it come to life. And I'm sure on the fly, they would, you know, like once in a while, like Tom would say, nah, that cue's wrong, or let's change the instruments. But generally, they, you know, because the meter was running, they, you know, what they did. 
did pretty well right the first time, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's where Tom Lavin, who was the music editor, came in very well. I mean, uh, the, just the orchestration of these things was amazing. And lest we forget, every song that was written uh, and then performed by some of our cast members, uh, the, the voice work was directed by Andrea Romano. And mm-hmm. I know that Julie Bernstein, uh, in writing these songs, uh, uh, you know, when she writing the, the melodies for all these little crazy lyrics, she'd be talking to Andrea almost every day to say, wait, can uh, Bernadette handle this thing? Or can, uh, can, can we go up here? Uh, will Tress freak out if I have her do this? You know, So Andrea uh, and, and Julie and Steve, uh, they, they would show up to these uh, song recording, uh, singing sessions. Randy, whenever his stuff was being recorded, he would be there too. And uh, I think Steve and Julie were, in a lot of the choruses, uh, they, like the Pinky and the Brain theme song, I know I hear Steve in there, the Pinky and the Brain, the Steve's in there. Yeah. yeah. And Julie's quite a, Julie does some great vocals. Beautiful voice, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, one of the other things that, you know, getting it to sing in their keys, because like when Tom and I worked on I'm Mad together, you know, we had all those three characters, in fact, four characters are all singing at the same time. And I make sure that they're all in their right keys. So I'd go to Richard for that because they used to pitch their voice up a little bit too once they did it. So oh my gosh. Yeah. So we couldn't get it out of Tress's range or below Tress. You know, so there was a little bit of trickiness to make sure that we're in the in the po- most powerful key for the singer. And certainly for Bernadette, you don't hand a Broadway actor something that's not in her key, you know. So right. right. And she would show up and uh you'd have to definitely make sure there was some time because she would be walking in and had not yeah. received the material uh, on many occasions. So she was like seeing it cold. So, and she didn't want, did, she did not want to put out a performance to the public that wasn't first rate. Mm-hmm. Somewhere I can hang my hat Somewhere for a dog and cat Somewhere Just imagine that We'll find a place called home A place we've been searching for A place we've been waiting for so long We've been searching for so long A place called home uh, So, you know, other writers... For the show, John P. McCann, Peter Hastings, Deanna Oliver, and, and the others that you uh, mentioned, you know, wrote many of the songs, including Nick and Rug. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. There was Sherry, so- Sherry Stoner was in there too. Sherry Stoner did a lot on the show too. Oh, absolutely. Oh yes, yeah. wrote. Uh, I am. Uh, let's see. I am a lab mouse. I escaped from my cage. The <laughs> Bubba Bob Bob Brain. Oh, that's right. That's oh right. gosh, what a what a great <laughs> one. <laughs> Um, be the dearest dear. <laughs> she did that. Well, uh, well, the, you also had these episodes that were, you know, these epic musicals. It, 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 you know, th- even King Yakko, I would consider like a musical slash Marx Brothers send up in a way. Absolutely. Uh, Les Miserables, West Side Pigeons, Pigeon on the Roof. Um, was it, it, it a special challenge putting those episodes together or was it? Kind of like almost any other episode because there was just a lot of music well, in every episode. Well, Randy, well, it's it's like you take three or four of Randy's uh, and Randy. I don't know how many songs he wrote, so many, and and you know, and they're standalone. So three or four of his big standalone multi-minute songs, and it's like doing that amount of work in one story, like uh, Les Mis or Animals or. There's also one by Rug. Uh, we are the very model of cartoon individuals, the, mm-hmm. the Gilbert and Sullivan mm-hmm. thing. Uh, and, of course, there's uh, uh, Peter Hastings, uh, King Yakko. Uh, they're, they're an immense amount of work. So, really, it's those writers, they, like Randy, they go off into their office and you don't see them for a couple weeks. <laughs> they're just really, really swamped, and they're it, like Randy said, it's a very cerebral job, and there they are. They're doing parodies or they're doing original stuff. Peter, like Randy, has a great musical background and would often write the melodies for his songs as well. Uh, but uh, for for and Deanna, her career is really in improv, doing musical improvs. So these people are so good at this; uh, they uh, they really turn out great product. But it's a tremendous amount of work. 
And so, uh, and, and Rug would, you know, you'd leave Rug alone. And he would go through different, he'd think he'd have it done. And then the next day he'd say, no, it's not working. And he'd come back a week later. So everybody had their own process. Uh, and eventually I would come in and say, I need this script now. It's got to be done. <laughs> that would be often how, uh, how this process would end. Yeah, that's like, yeah, exactly right. Where are you on this? You know, oh, you I, know it's another great song. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, the 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 Peter Hastings uh, about um, that's the parody of the Lion King. Oh, that's uh, terrible. The the one with uh, yeah, the, 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 the Tiger surprise, Prince. Yeah, the, the surprises tiger. in life. Yes. Yeah, yeah and he drops them. <laughs> now I know Peter just he he wrote the music and the and the lyrics. He just. He lived with that one for weeks, and it's just, it's three minutes, but it's perfect, you know? They keep us guessing. They mix it up. The surprises. The surprises in life. Oh. I thought they were supposed to land on their feet. I'll say though, on the on the ones that they did, like <laughs> Miser Animals or Pigeons on the Roof, the idea was obviously to do a parody of Fiddler on the Roof, a West Side Story, and they had to be very careful, obviously, because you're going to get sued. Uh, Warner, you know, we always used to get called by business affairs. You can't do that song. So what Steve and Julie would have to do was turn a song on its head. So instead of but da 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 da. But da 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 da. They'd have to go. But da 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 da. But you know, they have to do just as many notes as they could to not get sued. And, and so that was a trick for them to make it sound like you know the musical without it being the musical. So that was a challenge too. I was recently talking to Julie about uh, Les Misérables, right? So the the temp tracks came in, and I'm listening, and I loved uh, Les Mis, and so I'm listening to the temp tracks, and I'm like, oh my god, no, these this is this is way too close. Yeah. Now, she had done the same thing. She had turned it on its head. But in my head, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Oh, my gosh. It, it, it seems like the same thing. So I called Richard. It's too close. It's too close. Look at soon. <laughs> You're gonna fall. Richard, <laughs> Richard calls up to me. It's too close. It's too close. We'll get sued. <laughs> and so uh, Richard quickly, like, turned it more on its head. Yeah, he's good uh, at it. And <laughs> it, won, it won the Emmy that year. So, anyway. <laughs> for, for music, and 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 Cameron McIntosh did not show up to collect the Emmy, so we. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad that didn't happen. <laughs> well, uh, let's go ahead and get into discussion about how Randy got involved in the show and some of Randy's work. Um, so, uh, n number one, uh, Randy, you worked on Batman the Animated Series, and you worked on some of the my favorite episodes, Robin's Reckoning. Uh, the Two Face, uh, you know, two parter right there. But then you were going into Animaniacs. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, how did you how did you transition? Well, what's interesting is, you know, I don't know if people know this, but Tom was the creative head of Warner Brothers Animation, and Gene McCurdy was the business head. So when I first was, you know, I had never written for animation, and I, got, and I came in. I actually, you know, I don't know if you know this, Tom. Kelly Ward was the one that had recommended me to Barbara Simon. So I went over and I looked at the Bible, and Tom had worked on the Bible. I think also Paul Rugg and I mean not Paul Rugg, Paul Dini, and maybe Garen Wolf. But I had read, you know what, I, Tom? I read your script, which was Poison oh, right. Ivy. There was a Poison Ivy script and the one and only Gun Story, and I immediately go, oh, I get, you know. I totally get this, but I'd never met Tom because, you know, he was the high guy in the ivory tower there. So, and then they, but Tom had Tiny Toons. He had um, uh, uh, Tasmania going, you know, Bat all these shows. So they brought in Alan Burnett was working strictly on um, Batman. But I knew of Tom, of course, because he ran the studio. And also um, they were doing Tiny Toons. And I would, I would see sometimes, you know, when they would get in the conference room, I'd look in the room and they were all watching your cartoon that would come back. And I heard of Animaniacs. So I remember, go, I don't know if you remember this time, I kind of knocked on your door and I said, hey, my name is Randy Rogel. I'm working for Alan Burnett on, on, on uh, Batman. And you go, oh, good. But he needs help on that show. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, but I was really interested in Animaniacs and all that. So he paired me up with Peter. He said, hey, check this guy out. And so I wrote a Mindy and Buttons with Peter just to get, and he looked at that. And then 
Um, but, you know, they still had the staff in place. And I wanted to get on the show. Were you in the building at this point? Were you on staff in the building? Yeah, I was in the building, but not on your floor. And yeah, so but then I, I really wanted to get on this show because I wanted to work with, you know, Tom and the Spielberg people and all that. So I wrote Yakko's World as a uh, the country song and I brought it to Tom and, show, and he, he said, oh, I kind of like that. And he showed it to Steve and so they said, OK, all right, let's do another one. So they said, like, do the states and capitals. No, the first one, Yakko's World. I, I feel like you had that one. You were waiting to spring that one on us. It was like, <laughs> the, he was like, let's soften these guys up with a little mini and buttons or something. But now you had written something like that for to teach your, your child. Well, I was working with John, I mean, with Ryan on it, but never really finished it. So I thought, well, let me do that. You know? Yeah. So he's got all these, uh, these countries and it's like, and we knew he had Rob Paulson. Now, I think initially... I, did you say we should have Rob Paulson sing this? I, I think it was just like, listen to this. I didn't, I didn't even know who, I had never met Rob. I was just trying to impress you, Tom. So I could get, so I gave it to Tom. And <clears throat> we, yeah, I thought it was, I think I, I hope I reacted better than, oh, it was pretty good. No, no, I, you, you <laughs> liked it. And, and then you said, well, and you'd, I think you'd talk with Stephen about it. And other, and so, and then that's when you had me, I think, wrote the, the States, the Capitals. And then after that, they did with the Universe song. So I said, hey, I think we can do more than a list song. So we started doing some other songs. Yeah, yeah. It's got it, got kind of, kind of. And then Tom was gracious enough to let me have a piano in my office, so I didn't have to run home and do it, you know. And it just kind of picked up steam from there. And Yakko's world. Uh, it, so we get Rob Paulson to sing this thing, and he sings it in one or two takes, and it's like, wow. Uh, and he definitely prepped. He 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 got the, uh, this Yakko's world uh, click track ahead of time, and he prepped. So then it went to the director, Rusty Mills, and the board guy. And we we initially thought it was going to be pretty basic Yakko singing this thing and maybe with a map. So uh, they they put a lot of they, – they challenged themselves to put hats, a different hat for each country in in the little, anim, in the little uh, storyboard. And it became – this cartoon about hats. It's just right? too much, yeah, right. And, yeah. It was, and, and also, uh, I don't know if Lichtenstein has a hat. Yeah, or, exactly. or, or uh, Peru. Well, it's, it's possible, right? exactly. That was a lot of hats to figure out. And we said, you know what? Let's not spend all the money designing all these hats. Let's just <laughs> get through this thing. Anyway. I know, because I, you know, what I would usually do is I write the song, then I would write the script with what I saw to be the visuals. And that's what I would turn into Tom for, course, he, he would listen to the thing, look at the script. And then once I got approved, and sometimes I think a lot of times the animators or board artists had a better idea. But all I could think of was as he pointed to them, each of the each of the countries would light up for a moment so the kid could see which country it was. And I and, and I was trying to make it so that it was all, you know, you weren't jumping all around the world. It was like North America, South America, Central America. Then we went to Europe, India and all that. So I didn't see a lot. But I didn't know anything about animation, Tom. I figured these guys will figure that out. And by the well, way... That was a that was a great uh, choice. Only at the very end, you have to think, we got this one's over here. This one's I, over here. I ran up. I was in a corner at that point. I couldn't get out of that. Yeah. India, Pakistan, Burma, Afghanistan, Thailand, Nepal, and Bhutan. Cambodia, Malaysia, then Bangladesh, Asia, and China, Korea, Japan. Mongolia, Laos, and Tibet, Indonesia, the Philippine Islands, Taiwan. Sri Lanka, New Guinea, Sumatra, New Zealand, then Borneo, and Vietnam. Tunisia, Morocco, Uganda, Angola, Zimbabwe, Djibouti, Botswana. Mozambique, Zambia, Swaziland, Gambia, Guinea, Algeria, Ghana. Rwanda, Lesotho, and Malawi, Togo, the Spanish Sahara is gone. Niger, Nigeria, Chad, and Liberia, Egypt, and Nina, Gabon. Tanzania, Somalia, Kenya, and Mali, Sierra Leone, and Algier. Dahomey, Namibia, Senegal, Libya, Cameroon, Congo, Zaire, Ethiopia, Guinea, Bissau, Madagascar, Rwanda, Mayor, and Cayman. Hong Kong, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, Yugoslavia. Creek, Mauritania, then Transylvania, Monaco, Lichtenstein, Malta, and Palestine, Fiji, Australia, Sudan. What are your musical influences, and how has that incorporated into your work over the years? Minor yeah. yeah. Either one of you, both of you. Because what's interesting, you guys got to understand, you know, I know you think of Tom as a producer and a writer and a, a lot of songs. He, he wrote the Animaniacs theme song. He wrote the Pinky and the Brain theme song this year. But, I mean, if you're asking me what my influences are, I think you probably guess. See, I grew up with a great exposure to theater uh, when I was a kid. So I was influenced by a lot of the guys who write the kind of the Broadway stuff and or story or songs that tell a story 
or songs with kind of like clever lyrics and internal rhymes, that kind of thing. So that that really informs. You can tell when you listen to my music; it's really informed by that. I don't know what were your influences, Tom. Uh, well, if you go on to Hysteria, where Randy and I worked together again, I realized a lot of my influences were the theme songs to TV shows from our childhood because we parodied all of those in Hysteria. But I, I'd say my influences uh, musically, uh, you know, probably a lot of Disney movies, uh, uh, certainly um, all the Hanna-Barbera theme songs, um, you know, musicals like Singing in the Rain, uh, things that we all, and of course, you know, rock and roll. Uh, I was growing up in the 60s. There were two-minute, three-minute hit songs, uh, new ones every week. So uh, I, I really was hooked to the radio. So I was a very much a, a, a cultural sponge as a kid. I watched a lot of TV, saw a lot of movies, watched, listened to a lot of music. Uh, we had the record club that would send you records every every week. So uh, pretty eclectic, I'd say. <laughs> well, speaking of Singing in the Rain, give a quick little nod to Randy. You had a fantastic performance in a Singing in the Rain. You, if you go to YouTube, everyone, and you type in Make Him Laugh, Randy Rogel, you will see a performance by Randy Rogel that is amazing. Like you do the you do the flips, you do the singing, you do the dancing. It's amazing. Um, I, I just wanted to say that. Well, <laughs> I, I, I have to give a little nod to Tom on this. You know, I, I did twenty six productions of that show because I grew up going a lot of theater, and so well, here I'm on staff for Warner Brothers, but I get offered these professional, you know, performances at big theater. I, you know, it would be like the the um, paper mill theater, in the, you know, up, up at the. Um, Oh God! I went to which I went to the Benedum Center. I went to the you know uh, the tour of it in Dallas musicals. So I went to Tom and said, "Tom, can I go do a show? Come on!" <laughs> and, and it was like, "Okay, if you get your songs and your scripts in in on time." They, so they let I mean, how generous they let me go. And I would you know I would get up in the morning. It, usually, what would happen is during that few days week of rehearsal, I would just take a vacation. So I because I had all day rehearsal. But once the show opened, I just performed at night. Other one I had a matinee, so I worked during the day, perform at night, which is great. And so uh, that that was another reason I got to do that. But doing, so I did I did a lot of singing in the rain and me and my girl, and I did uh, the the George M. Cohen role in um, in George M. And you never broke your leg doing the the flip and singing in the rain. Thank God, no. Others I, have not fared so well. And in the words of Eddie Bob, Samuel J. Snodgrass, as he was about to be led to the guillotine, make him laugh. Make them laugh. Don't you know everyone wants to laugh? <laughs> my dad said, be an actor, my son. But be a comic to one day will be standing in line. All those old honky tonk monkey shines. Now you can study Shakespeare and be quite elite. And you can charm the critics and have nothing to eat. Just slip on up and down, he will twirl the chippy. Make them laugh, make them laugh, make them laugh. There's been a lot of comparisons with, speaking of musical influences, with uh, music of Tom Lair. I'm wondering oh, yeah. if I'm wondering if uh, Tom Lair had any uh, influence on the songs, like educational songs. Things I remember like that. Randy. I remember Randy brought in Tom Lair and played it uh, for us just to. Oh, check I did because yeah, I remember Tom Lair really well as a kid. And by the way, it was you know, who was it? I heard Aaron Sorkin talking about Patty Chayefsky. He said basically, no, he was playing a whole different game. I have to say that about Tom Lair. He was playing a whole different game. But Tom, I don't know if you know this. But um, because, I mean, Lair wrote some of the most brilliant satire stuff. But Tom Lair, um, we we would get notes sent to the studio from fans. And I think this one went to Gene McCurdy. I don't know if it came from you, but it came from Gene. And somebody and they sent it. And so she handed it to me. And it was saying, why don't you do a song with all of the elements of the periodic table? And so I wrote back, I said, because Tom Lair already did it perfectly, <laughs> I just don't have to improve on it, right? There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and astatine, and radium, and gold, protactinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. 
There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. But yeah. I saw an interview later with Tom Lehrer, Tom, and they were asking him about the song, and they got into the idea of some of his list songs. And he says, you know, that thing with all the elements, I always wondered, why didn't you ever do a song with all the countries of the world? And Tom Lehrer said, you know, I tried it, and I just couldn't figure out how to make it work. I couldn't do it. I went, ah! <laughs> For at least I had my one moment with Tom Lehrer. <laughs> Beautiful. But, you know, he's Beautiful. still alive. He, I just saw there were, you know, there was just an interview on with him about two weeks ago. He's, he's like 90 now. Yeah. He, yeah. A Harvard math professor, I believe, too. A, a genius yeah, guy. I'd say he and Dave Frischberg, those kind of guys doing satire. Also Sondheim, people just did really cool satire. Mm. Uh, Lear was a math uh, professor major? Is that what you said? I believe so, yeah. That was Randy Rogel. He was a math major, were you not? I, yes, I have, an, I have an engineering degree. So my, you know, a lot of physics and math. Well, and there's something there. Well, let's go over to our own engineering major slash mi- math minor, Nathan. Oh. <laughs> that's me who <laughs> uh yeah I, I have a question uh regarding the cds uh from going from the cd to the show or in some cases going from the show to the cd um i guess like wh- which way does that usually go and then a lot of times there's alternate lyrics in these things and even times i know randy you've talked about alternate lyrics not being used in the show that had to be so i mean yeah, I guess this whole kind of topic going Tom, on. Do you, so. remember, do you remember this? I, Plus, I, you I go, go for it. Okay, so I'd written the songs for the show, right? And, you know, that would be a process where I would submit to Tom, and Tom would give me his notes, and we would go back and forth, and that's how that worked. So those were all approved, went into production. So then they exported them to CDs. And so one day I get a call from Ron Paulson. And he's in a recording session. And he said, at, at, at where they're doing it for the radio. No, excuse me, for the CD. And oh. he says, did you know they're changing your lyrics on, on the Earthquake song? I said, no, what are you talking about? So they, he put this woman on the phone. I don't know who this woman was. But <laughs> some, some woman who worked in like children's psychology or whatever. And she was absolutely convinced that the earthquake song, the way I'd written it, would traumatize the children of Los Angeles, right? And But here's how she came across. Oh, Randy, don't worry about it. I've written tons and tons of songs for kids. I know how to do this. I said, ah. but if you were going to change my lyrics, why wouldn't you come to me, right? So, And I remember she started getting really, you know, you know, really haughty about it. And she said, well, why don't I just take it off the record then? I said, well, that's fine. Just take it off the record. And she got all upset. So then I went down to Tom and Tom, I remember you were really busy. What? What? And I said, they're changing my lyrics, you know? And, I, and he went, who's doing that? So he got on the phone with her, but oh. as they were so far along and he was saying, I don't want to call Steven into this or whatever. So she kind of got away with it. But like there was lines where I said, whose fault? Whose fault? The San Andreas's fault. Because Mr. Richter can't predict her kicking our asphalt, right? She said, if you say San Andreas Fault, that means it's L.A. I've got to take out all references to L.A. So that's what they, it, on, on the album, that's what it is. That's what she got. But it's because she pulled it at the last minute and there was no reaction time. So I was always like, gee, thanks, lady. If you want it. This was my first experience, I think, with HR at, at, at Warner Brothers, Randy. <laughs> because I, I, had the, I had a conversation with who I assumed to be the exact same person, the same person pulled all the wacko burp songs from the album, oh, geez. Which, which were, you know, which I can imagine if you're driving your kids to school in the morning and suddenly <laughs> here's wacko Warner, you know, da, 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 eh, 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 eh. I think they'd go crazy. Your, your kids would start the day with a big laugh, but she, oh no, that's so disgusting. You can't possibly. <laughs> so I remember being in the editing room, uh, and they connect me to this person. <laughs> my, I got my veins popping out of my head. <laughs> no! And uh, yeah, so I, I, I had a breakdown. And they, that woman must have had some power because uh, sh- those, of course, they never made it into the album. Yeah. Hmm. I think yeah. she was licensing. Licensing. I, I, but I think, you know, what it was is that 
it was under the radar, and at the last minute she was doing it, so we had no reaction time, and so they didn't want Spenman to come back, so that's why she got away with it. That's but it was, just, it was just a shame it's sometimes the way, you know, studio like works, but I, I don't know if that answers your question there, Nathan. That's what happened. I that. think well, another uh, song, uh, there was another song that I recall. Uh, they, the president's they, song was different, I know, from yeah. the CD to the... Well, I, I had I had John... When I went to tell him about the president's song, I said, you know, instead of doing a list song, why don't we say something about each president? He said, okay, let's do that. And we had to be careful it didn't get too long and boring. But in that, it was something... One of it was like um, something... Like, he got John, uh, Richard Nixon, he got John F. Kennedy, he got shot. And, 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 and Gerald Ford fell down a lot. But mm-hmm. they said we can't say that, so instead we went Camelot. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So that that was the change in that one. And of course, at the very end, it said uh, the one in the one in charge is plain to see. It's Clinton, first name Hillary, and yeah. then of course, and the <laughs> cartoon. Yeah, they, 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 so I guess which came first, right there? In, in that case, it, it was the CD track that came first, and then that got changed for the cartoon. In that case, no, no, I no. Think that- the cartoon came first, Tom. Tom, don't you think we were? I was writing for the cartoon, right? And so it was, it was Clinton for his head now in Washington D.C. The one in charge is plain to see. Oh no, the one there, there's the Democrats on the GOP. The oh. one in charge is plain to see. It's Clinton, and we, you know, her back to the chairs to the body goes. It's Clinton, first name Hillary, and you know, it's funny that now that we had the the election, although she lost to Trump, that I thought, oh, that almost came true, didn't it? Yes, it did. <laughs> Well, we at one time we could add to that song and have a lot of fun right now, couldn't we? And I, I, I saw the lyrics <laughs> online of Duke Gingrich song too, Randy, which is hilarious. We Did never you, made that one. You know what's amazing about that, Tom? Is we had during the Republican Revolution in '94. You know, when Newt Gingrich came in, and they so Tom and I had this idea: what if Don, similar to Judy Garland writing that love letter to Clark Gable, "You made me love." What if Dot is writing this love song to Newt, but basically, <laughs> basically it's, you know, Mr. Gingrich, you're so cute in that baggy Walmart suit and shoes you bought a 19 You know, in other words, she's complimenting him, but at the same time beating the shit out of him. And I think, <laughs> I think Stephen killed it or whatever, but we actually did record it. And so oh. now, Tom, I think they left the Tress left the script or signed it for somebody. Because it oh. hit its way onto the internet. And here's how the internet works. I had lost that. I totally forgot because we never produced that song. And then later on, I found that script online. I got my script back. So somebody, I know. I saw the script yesterday. Yeah. And somebody, t- somebody took it upon themselves to kind of storyboard it and animate it or something. So it's like, wow. I mean, that was, wow. a, that was a song totally lost to history. And somebody found it. Well, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, that's- now there were other songs on the CDs as well that were. It doesn't seem like they were ever animated. I, I, you know, like in Yakko's world, especially on that CD, uh, you know, several drops, several drops of rain. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there was a "I'll Take an Island" that John McCann wrote, I believe, uh, yeah. and the "Hello" song. Uh, were those intended to be for the show, or were those just strictly for those CD soundtracks? <laughs> I think I when I wrote I wrote several drops of rain. I think I always wrote them to be animated. You know, I, I even wrote the script with all the visuals, and just for some reason, because of whatever our schedule was, that one just didn't end up becoming animated. But it did end up it did end up on the album, right, Tom? Is that how that? That's happened? that is absolutely right. It's just by then I think we were you know running out of uh, real estate for the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Drops of rain forming ripples in a puddle that they make. And that puddle grows beyond into something called a pond, spreading outward till it turns into a lake. When that lake springs a leak, then it forms a little creek, which goes rushing down and turns into a stream. And the water keeps on flowing, so the trees can keep on growing in a pattern that is showing nature's scheme. And every flower, every weed, get the water that they need from that little stream which trickles by and in the swamp it picks up germs from bacteria and worms and if you drink it you'll get really sick and die hey, this is my song randy i met you at dragon con a couple years ago and yep. um you you had me sing the nations of the world song because i told you that i knew it uh-huh. and um i wondered how often do fans come up to you and tell you that they they know it and sing it for you most of them um i do it to rob a lot of them have done it to me, but I think you're the only one who's done it right. 
who actually sang it all. Was that in Atlanta that we were? We, yes. Okay, I do remember that. And you, But I've had, it's kind of cute to see a kid. In fact, one of the great things, Tom, I think you came with us when we first did the show. We got it. We were still, you know, we're here in Los Angeles. We got invited. Uh, it was Gene McCurdy, Tom, me, I think Paul Rudd, to a local school where they had a hundred first graders all had memorized Yakko's World. They were going to perform it for us, right? So it's kind of cool that they have the Warner Brothers. Show. So we got there. Oh my God, it was just awful, but it was so cute. None of them had it. It was just like this big mishmash, but it was just the most fun thing. But um, I remember Peter Hastings went to that too. Yeah. And I remember he said to me, this means something yeah. that, that there are schools around this country doing this. This show is having an impact. Yeah. And he was right. Mm -hmm. And his, all that stuff, the pink in the brain that you guys did, that was great. But um, I, you know, it's really an honor for me that you would take the time to memorize the song. I'm just so, you know, I loved it. it. It was what got me hooked on the show. I thought it was the most brilliant thing I'd ever heard. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> real long to hear that. Uh, I've told you, Andy, that my pal Parker McDonald opened up this big bank conference with uh, international bankers with, with the song. And everybody <laughs> was just like, they were getting up and clapping along with it. You know. Do you know what the original ending of the song was? Because you know, he goes, you know, uh, you know da Then I went to, we are the world. We are the children. Why should someone write a song like this? It's pretty bewildering. <laughs> that was the end. Of that. Very nice. But I obviously didn't think this would get sued. <laughs> I guess, Nathan, can you go for the question from Malik right there? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I have a question from Malik here. It says, I'm a big fan of Mr. Rogel's music and his way of making lyrics that uh, not only rhyme, but make complete sense, which isn't, a <laughs> which isn't as common as I like in many songs. My question is, how do you manage to find the perfect pairing of words like that? And what was one song you wrote uh, had your brain racking when trying to find a good rhyme slash line? As someone who'd love, uh, who'd love to write songs like yourself, this is something I must know. Well, isn't that a sweet question? I will say Yakko's World was a little was a little challenging in that I, I wasn't just trying to to rhyme the end, you know, da 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 I'm curious if you would agree with this, Tom, when they ask, what's the hardest script you've ever written? or What's the hardest song you've ever written? It's the one you're writing right now. <laughs> and then, and then you're, you're breaking your brain. And then, and then once you get it, you crack it, and it's all polished and done. And you, you move on. And it seems so easy. Then you go, oh, why was that so hard? You know, that, but it's, it's when you're in the, pro, you know, because we, like we said, we lock ourselves in a room and, and, you know, grapple with. You know, how do I make this funny? How do I make this clever? How, and, and, and there's no, you know, there's no, uh, like you're an engineer, right? So I can, I can give you a bridge and I'd say, if you, build, if you do these 50 steps in a row, at the end of it, you'll have a bridge. And mm -hmm. it'll, nothing says at the end of the day, if you've worked all day on a script, or that it's good. You know, you're, 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 you have to say, you know, you sometimes like, like Paul's a perfect example. He kind of was sitting, he comes to Tom the next day, he goes, oh my God, Tom. Everything wrote, it's bad. I can't. And then, of course, you get a guy, yeah, well, I need it in time. So, yeah, so you have that pressure on you. So that's what makes it hard. But, you know, that's the that's the exciting part of it, too. But for that person writing, I, I will say a, a little bit of advice for someone who wants to. And, again, I, I'm writing sort of in the broader term, um, is always write for the singer. If, if it's hard for the singer to sing it, if the words get jumbled up in the mouth, like a perfect example, Yakko's World, if those words didn't flow trippingly, there's nothing Rob could do to help me. You know, you, you really want to make it easy for the singer to sing it and that the lyrics sound like, you know, somebody would say it. Um, that, that's the way. And, and if you have three rhymes, always go for the most clever on the third rhyme is mm. the obvious. Mm -hmm. So that's... Mm. All right. and, then, and then you find, then, then sometimes you find something just drops in your lap. Like I, I remember in the, I'm cute. When she said, I'm cute and I'm cuddly. So she, she, she's, I'm the one they adore. I'm, I, so I'm sweet and I'm cuddly and small, just like Dudley, but more. 
it's a chore. <laughs> Those things will sometimes fall into your lap. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, I found, so this is something Rug wrote, and I, th- this was Rob, and I think these words are really tough to, to get through, but he did, and they're so clever. When in a jam, I just shall stop and villains in their tracks are froze. Then I sneak up and utter start and take my hands and honk their nose. I am quite proud to be in such a hierarchical progeny from Daffy Duck and Tweety Bird to Babs and Buster Bunny. To suit my mood, I can call forth a lot of different sceneries from outer space and desert scapes and Himalayan eateries. From this bag here, why I can pull most anything imaginable like office desks and lava lights and Bert, who is a cannibal. You see, in matters comical, unusual, and whimsical, we are the very models of cartoon individuals. Oh my gosh, what a batch of words. <laughs> you, gotta make it, you gotta make it easy to sing it. And then, and some of Randy's songs are packed with, I mean, some of your songs have lots of words, lots right? Of, my songs are known for lots of words, you know? So yes. I'm sure they can sing. But like Tom Lehrer took that same song, when he did the elements and going, hey, there's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and uranium. In other words, you can, they come rolling off your tongue. If you, nice. you don't do that for the singer. If the singer is stumbling all over your words, it's not going to work. And also, yeah. you know, a lot of times, if you have a big note to hold, you want to make that a vowel. Okay, so they can keep, ah, keep ah. their mouth open and all that. And then, but you also want a good lyric. So there's, but it's the, or, sometimes, it, Randy, it's like the order of words. Uh, some words don't go mesh, mesh together that well, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely right. Randy, you speaking of I'm um, cute, real quick. You did mention to me in, in Tucson that at one point you would, you had a you had some lyrics for I'm old for Slappy Squirrel. Tom, did I ever tell you that? Oh, let's now. I want to hear this. Yes, I, I had an idea. We never did it, right? But because we just ran out of time and we moved on to hysteria. But I had an idea for Slappy to do instead of I'm cute, I'm old. I'm old. I'm a mess. I gotta confess when you roll, it's a drag. You get flabby and crabby and things start to sag. You know, it's just it's just slappy screw. I'm oh bliss face and I'm old. And then Walter Wolf and they came in old and they were on canes. Oh baby, she's old, old, old. Yeah. And I I, I I had written tons of lyrics I just never ended up doing, but I thought it would be hysterical. Weird. Now that would be you get Sherry and Jess yeah. and Animaniacs live, that would be Fantastic. Oh, God. I should, yeah. <laughs> and there were some really fun lyrics to it, I thought. Right? That's hilarious. <laughs> but it was never produced. So we, I guess that's something for the future, maybe, right? We can never that's something that. absolutely uh, that you should, uh, you know, it's yours. Hang yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Give it to uh, Sherry and uh, Jess do it. Well, let's, yeah. let's talk about what you're doing right now. And that's, of course, Animaniacs in Concert, Randy. Uh, yes. T- tell us what what's going on with Animaniacs in concert. It's a it's a. It's well, a all that happened was that Rob Paulson and Jess and Tress, you know, they do they're the actors, and so they do lots of personal appearances. And so Rob, you know, he told me he says, "Hey, Randy, every time I go to one of these cons, people are always asking me to sing these songs." I thought, "Oh, great, you know, that's wonderful." So he has this podcast that he does, and he's got like a hundred thousand listeners on it. I mean, he does it on animation. So they asked him to do a live one up here at Universal Studios. So Nathan and I know we both live very close here to Universal Studios. So uh, Tom, he did it with Mo, and they did it as Pinky in the Brain, and they you know sold it right out. So they said, can you do another one? So desperately, he says, hey, Randy, you live next door to Universal Studios. Why don't you come up? We'll just sit, you'll sit at the piano. We'll just sing some of the songs. So we just winged it. But we had a great response. So we did it again. We did it again. We went... So they said, well, you know, maybe this could be a show. Uh, it did so. But then we had to talk to Warner Brothers and get their permission, Steven's permission, all that. So we've just started doing this little thing in concert now. We've done it with the Colorado Symphony. We did it with the La Mirada Symphony. But we also do it in a more intimate show with just me and Rob. We've been doing it all over the place. So next we're going to be, for those of you in the New York, Manhattan area, we will be at Joe's Pub. We're returning there. Because we sold it out twice already, we're going to be we're going to be there May. It's Memorial Day weekend, twenty fifth, twenty sixth, and twenty fourth, twenty fifth, twenty sixth, twenty seventh. That Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, seven thirty and nine o'clock p.m. each night. So go to Joe's Pub at the Public Theater, and uh, you can get your tickets. But we're you know we've been gosh we've been to Tucson, we've been to 
um, Atlanta. We were in Honolulu. We were in Pittsburgh. We just got back from Oklahoma City. We've ended up in San Francisco. We were in Dallas and Arlington. We've done a lot of different places. So, and the fan, you just, it's what amazes me, Tom, is how many Animaniacs fans there still are and how much they know the show and they know the song. So it's, and I always tell the fans, this is really a treat for me because I'm the guy, like I would represent like the writers, the, the, the artists, the composers who sit in our room. <laughs> so we never, we never get to see how the audience reacts to what we do. You know, Rob and just they get in front of the audiences all the time at those cons. So I said, it's really a treat for me to be here on stage and see, well, like Tom, when you were in La Mirada and you could see everybody, what, how they respond to the, to the material. It's a real treat for us, you know? Absolutely. And uh, test, testimony that you do have a lot of fans, eight shows coming up in New York, eight. That's pretty big. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna be pretty cool. That's great. And so should we... Shows? And should we say anything about a special appearance from a, a, your, your son there, uh, Tom, coming up? Oh, he's going to be there on the 25th. Um, Let's and not say what he's going to uh, say, but uh, he, he's, going to, uh, he's going to do something with you. Right? Yes, Cody is going to be performing. And Cody played several of the roles in MS, but one of them was the Bluebird, who sang yeah. the little Bluebird sings. So you'll get to see Cody. He's, he's a couple of weeks older now. <laughs> and uh, it'll be very fun. that'll be a very fun part of the show. So, yes, and, and, you know, everybody get your tickets. You'll love the show. Absolutely. Uh, well, yeah, it's 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 definitely something to check out. Uh, it's I know that you were mentioning, uh, you know, the the people that follow along. You actually have some groupies. I know that there are some people that uh, one of our listeners in Oklahoma drove all the way over to Tucson to see you, and then drove back over to Oklahoma, you know, went back home and saw you in Oklahoma as well. So you have. Wow. You have some people that follow you around, basically, for these that's concerts. Mostly, that's mostly Rob. They're going to see him. <laughs> <laughs> when he comes out, he starts doing all those funny voices. You know, they, they say, oh, my God, there's Pinky live. There's the, you know, Yakko live. So, let's, you know, in all modesty, it was Tom who created and gave us all of our jobs. And we can thank him for putting our kids' uh, braces on our kids' teeth and uh, putting <laughs> We had a good run. We had a very nice run there. Yeah. Let me ask Randy one question. Uh in your concerts, what song uh, do you find uh, people? I mean, I know they're going to respond to uh, Yakko's World, but uh, any any song that you're really happy with the response or that surprises you? Well, you know, Noel. They, you know, they they love that Noel. And 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 what you know, we we start off with um, Yakko's Universe, and then I, and then I go to the original ending, which I made this cut, and that introduces the idea that the censors were all over us. So then we do Lake Titicaca, and <laughs> unfortunately they can see it because we say we don't say yeah. So you know Tom and Gunn and we they wanted to do a, a, a one on a ge geography on a lake down in South America. And they go okay, well now that's good geography, and so we do Lake Titicaca. But they see it cut. You can see they go oh yeah, yeah, and they start laughing way ahead of time. Funny, but um, funny. you know we do some of the hysteria songs too, and they really they love those too. That's great. The, the history song. I love doing the history songs. I, I'm mad. Oh the, yeah. The, the, and, you know, for, for those of you who know I'm mad, but I came to Tom one day. My kids were having a fight in the car, right? And uh, Tom had three boys, you know. So he heard that. He goes, oh, my God. So he said, let's make this long. Because I only had it for the verse that they were in the car. So Tom says, no, no, no. Let's have them waking up in the morning, fighting the other Then they get in the car. Then they get to the circuit. But, so we turned it into this behemoth song. And that gets a big reaction, Tom. Well, well, that's you. You do you do that without Tress and uh, Jess, or do you wait for them on that? No, no. Well, Rob and I'll do it without Tress and Jess. But when we have the four of us, obviously, then all four of us do it. Yeah, guys, we both It's quite Great. impressive seeing Randy and Rob going back and forth between the two of them when it's originally meant for essentially four characters, even though Rob does half of them, you know, half of those four, it's still it's a, 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 definitely a highlight of the show. Do you play Dot, Randy? He plays Scratch and Stuff, too. But do you play Dot? I do Dot, and I do Wacko. He does Scratch and Stuff and Yakko. Uh, uh, actually, Scratch and Stuff. No, no, he has a lot to sing in it. So, yeah, yeah Rob, does. Uh, Rob does most of the singing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a really fantastic show. Animaniacs and concerts definitely something everyone should 
check out. And uh, is there a website for that? I forget if that's yeah. Anime, you go to animaniacslive.com. Okay. And I think Animation Concert might get you there too, but the original was AnimaniacsLive.com, so that's the website to go to. And that tells you where we're going to be next. It tells you where we've been, all the news, and all that kind of thing. Okay. Hold on. I just, that was my, okay. I, well, we so know what that know. sound means. <laughs> well, that sound means that it's time to wrap things up, I guess. Uh, so, yes, uh, Animaniacs in Concert. It was called Animaniacs Live, but, of course, he had to change the name because I guess people thought that the Animaniacs characters – if we're going to come out in suits or something like that. So, right. It's, it's, it's a funny suit, and, and yeah, it's not that kind of a show. So. Yeah, it's, yeah, but it is a fantastic it's, show. It's, it's a more of adult. It's not a little kitty show. It's more of an, you know, it's more adult. highbrow. It's, yeah, more <laughs> highbrow. There you go. Yes, very highbrow. We're Lake, we're Lake Titty Cock stuff. <laughs> that, that's how highbrow we are. Exactly. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get to some contact information then. Nathan, let's start with you. Where can people get in contact with you online? Joey, I'm on Twitter. Django FT, that's me. All right. And Kelly, what about you? I'm on Twitter at Yoda Princess, P R N C S S, and also Kelly at BigShinyRobot.com for email. All righty. And Animaniacast, we are on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and you can, of course, reach us at Animaniacast at RetroZap.com for all of your emails. Tom! If people wanted to harass you online, where should they go? Home. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Joey, insert what I said last time. I think uh, it's cartoonatics, but can you uh, add the details? Cartoonatics.blogspot.com, I believe. Done. There you go. And uh, you're also on Twitter, but you know, Tom's. You know, don't don't bother the man on Twitter, please. Come on, people, leave him alone. (laughs) <laughs> no, but, um, <laughs> and Randy, what about you? I, you have is it you? I see a Twitter account on Twitter. I am, yeah, I haven't used it, but you know what? I, I you can get me on on like my Facebook page, and it's um, they set it up for me. It's it's this Randy Rogel fan page. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Randy Rogel fan page, and I do check that, and I do you know uh, because my other one is just for my family and close you know relatives and all that. But the Randy Rogel fan page, if you want to talk Animaniacs, I'm on that one. You can get me there. Fantastic, and uh, yeah, see Randy in uh, Animaniacs in concert as well, so you can you know shake his hand. I know Randy. Yeah, let's. My wife is going to kill me, but she became the biggest fan of you after seeing you in concert. She just thought, I want to hang out with Randy Rogel and have him sing to me all the time. So, oh, that's uh, real. And I tell her, thank you. And, you know, um, you, when you do come to Animaniacs in concert, afterwards, we always do meet with, you know, yes. crowds and stuff, you know, Rob, this and stuff. So it is fun to hang out with the fans and talk and yeah. love that. I guess that'll do it for us. So for Nathan, Kelly, Tom, and Randy, this is Joey saying good night, everybody. 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 This podcast is not endorsed by Warner Brothers or Amblin Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Animaniacs, the Warner Brothers logo, all names, pictures, and sounds of the Animaniacs characters or any other Animaniacs related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Warner Brothers, Amblin Entertainment, or their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the Animaniacs unless otherwise indicated. of the 70s and 80s are all grown up, but the good times of childhood don't have to end. Our generation can share the fun and fandom of our youth with the next generation and bring the past into the future. And wrap it all up to make a fantastic present. Join Jedi Swar and Shaz Bazaar every Monday morning to get your work week started by reminiscing about the past and exploring the future with your earbuds on Techno Retro Dads. So find us on iTunes, Facebook, Twitter, or on RetroZap.com. Part of the RetroZap Network. Uh, hi there, this is uh, Frank. I'm uh, here interviewing people about the lovely people over at tpublic.com who are our sponsors for today's show. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Can you come here? Yeah. What, what's that? Well, I was wondering if you, sir, liked t-shirts. Like them? I love
of t-shirts. I wear a t-shirt every day. Well, I see. Whoa, watch out for the traffic. Jeez, it's crazy out here. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I was wondering, uh, did you know that T Public is a great place to go for independent artist designs? No, I did not. And did you know that by going to Tee Public uh, and uh, seeing all those uh, different shirts, you are not only getting an awesome shirt, but you are helping sponsor uh, various independent artists around the world? No, I did not. And did you also not know that if you went to teepublic.animaniacast.com, you could see a selection of Animaniacs Pinky in the Brain, Tiny Toons, Freakazoid, Spielberg, and various other designs selected by the hosts of the Animini cast. No, I... Well, actually, yeah, I did know that. Oh. Well, yeah. So, anyway, head on over to tpublic.animanicast.com. I already did. Look at this awesome shirt I'm wearing. Wow, it's the Animini cast logo. Yep, and there's a bunch of other ones up there, too. So head on over to tpublic.animaniacast.com. 